So are you ready to start building? Come on, grab your tools. Let's get going. Come on, we're going to build. We're going to build together. Well, wait a minute. Let me ask you a few questions to see if you really are a builder. First of all, what is the tallest building in the world? A library. It's got the most stories. Boom. Did you hear the joke about the roof? Oh, never mind. It's over your head anyway. Did you uh, hear what one wall said to the other? I'll meet you in the corner. What nails do carpenters hate hammering? Fingernails. What animal can jump higher than a house? Any animal. A house can't jump. Now, I'm going to turn some of this humor into a real serious business. What are we really wanting to build now that you're a builder and we're agreeing because you passed the test of flying colors? You understand all the wonderful inference that, uh, that's necessary to become that builder? Oh, wait a minute. Or do you? Because what we're building today is one of the most important things we can do in our lives. And that's building a consciousness. Building a consciousness of bliss. And how important that is for our life, for that's our journey here on this earth. Today's text you read so beautifully, found again on the back of your bulletin if you want to resource it once again. The Apostle Paul is talking about something beautiful happening within his life. He's saying, I live, but yet it's not me that's living. I live, but it's not me that's living. It's the Christ alive in me. The Christ consciousness, the mind of Christ aware and alive within me. And I'm joyously celebrating. I live, I live. I, say it with me. I live. Oh, I think you do more joyous than that. Come on. I live. Are you really joyously living? Come on. I live. That's it. Exactly. He's saying, I live, but it's not me. It's not the Apostle Paul. It's not me, this human being. What's living alive, what's really generating this joy, peace, and happiness within me is the very mind of Christ, the consciousness of Christ, the awareness of the Christ, that wonderful awareness of the divine essence of who we are. For Christ consciousness, Christ awareness, and the understanding of the Christ within us is to understand that we all are children of God. We are the sons and daughters of God. We are the revelation of God. This is the very consciousness of the Christ, Jesus, who taught and moved amongst this earth and who inspired people to their highest and their very best within their lives. So the Apostle Paul is writing to us a great secret, a great clue, a great key for our life. He's learning how do we develop this consciousness of bliss? this awareness, this way of thinking, this understanding of joy, peace, and happiness. It's about allowing us to live with the life of Christ, the mind of Christ, the essence, and the understanding of all that is there for us in consciousness to be alive within us. For what we want most is to be building this kind of life on a day-to-day -day basis. Isn't that true? I mean, do you want any other consciousness than a consciousness of bliss? Do you want to be every day loaded down with uh, consciousness of, boy, it's tough, it's rough, it's a hard day. All I can think about is how terrible it is. It's just going to be a disastrous moment in life. I don't, really don't want to go on. That's not the consciousness we want. But a day-to-day -day journey of awakening to this wonderful, powerful truth. I live abundant life. I live exactly as Jesus taught and preached. He spoke to us constantly. If you too can have this abundant life. This life full of joy, a consciousness then that's full of great bliss. This is how we do it, believe it or not. It's based on this. Because so much of our thinking is uh, based in uh, the world around us and all the things that come at us. What shapes our reality is our thoughts, and our thoughts are very creative, aren't they? They're very creative. They manifest in wonderful ways or in challenging ways for our lives. So our life, our bliss, is going to be based on the wonderful ability to say, I can screen some of these thoughts. I don't have to entertain every thought that comes. Right? And you know, you can watch the news, and you don't have to welcome everything that's on the news. You don't have to entertain it in your life. You know, you can just say, what, uh, whatever, and just allow it to flow on through. Receive some of its information, but don't let it resonate and take home. So you have a screen how about a screen door? Y'all know what a purpose of a screen door is? 
I lived in Africa, and I certainly know the importance of a screen door. You know, those bugs want to keep flying in and out all the time. But the screen door was there to allow this wonderful breeze and fresh air to come through, to allow you to sort of be one with all of that nature outside, but allow the wonderful air to come through without all that the air might bring, such as those nasty little creatures. So it is, it was the screen door became the ability to say, I'll let this through, but not that through. So do you have a screen door on your thought life? If you don't, I suggest that in your building a consciousness of bliss, you start putting one in today. A screen door that sort of filters through these things, I'll entertain these things I will not. These things I will welcome in my life, these things I will not. It's sort of like you need a bouncer at the door or that sort of uh, doorman who who's there at the club. You know, he's the one who everybody lines up. He says, you're in. You can come on in. Let me check your ID. You're too young. Uh, you know, you're not welcome in. Uh, you know, you can come in. You can come in. Uh, you, and sort of like picking through and allowing people to come through. It's that sort of the doorman at the door of our lives. So, too, how important it is if we're going to have this consciousness of bliss. We sort of had this screen door and maybe even someone like a doorman there at that door checking us, checking out what is really that we want to entertain and welcome within our thought life. You see, the thoughts being so creative can change the impact uh, and impact our life in so many different ways. How about the biblical example of the children of Israel who have left Egypt marching and moving towards their promised land? How can you imagine this? It's a promised land. I can imagine the conversations. Everyone's talking about it. We're going to the promised land. What will it be like? What will we like when we get there? How wonderful it's going to be. We're going to be settled. We'll build homes. We'll no longer be nomadic. We'll have moved out of bondage of Egypt and our own and our, the sense of slavery into now a sense of freedom. We'll build towns and villages. Can you imagine how exciting it's going to be? We'll have a farmland. We'll have land for raise, grazing for our sheep, and we'll have wonderful places to just exist and celebrate life to its fullest. And as they're moving, I can imagine their visioning of what was promised to them. And then they send spies into, or scouts, go in and check it out. When they return, 10 of them are saying, honey, you don't want to go there. Mm -mm. Big giants. Lots of problems, lots of hassles. That's not a place for us. We don't really want to do this. It's, you should be afraid. Get, be scared now even thinking about what you might face when you go in there. There's going to be obstacles galore. You see, what happened is the children of Israel just didn't have a screen door. And there was no bouncer at the door or no doorman there to say, wait a minute, we're not going to entertain those thoughts. And what happened? Well, they entertained those thoughts. And they spent the next 40 years wandering in the wilderness, unable to go into a promised land. Wow. Promised. Sure deal. Done deal. It's yours. It's provided for you. It's there. Yet what's holding them back was the entertainment of these kind of thoughts, developing a belief system. I said, there's no way we can do this. So, too, in our own individual life, as we're trying to develop this consciousness of bliss within us, we may welcome some thoughts, ideas, those conversations that come from people gathered around the water cooler or people gathering around at work or at home or in family or what you hear on the news. And suddenly you begin to entertain it. We can't do this. It's not possible. We'll never be successful. The world is bad. This is really, there's so much evil around us. There's so much to be uh, disappointed in rather than to be joyous. And the consciousness of bliss slips away from us. And instead, what happens then is we miss out on all that is promised, guaranteed, secured for us already. So what happens then in our life is that we must realize and ask the question, am I the master of those thoughts? Or am I allowing those thoughts to lead me and take me on this kind of journey? Oh, you say, but you know what, Pastor? Don't worry. Don't worry. In the midst of all these challenges, and I've entertained thoughts of fear and worry and doubt and lack, and I've welcomed all these thoughts in, and I left the screen door open, and honey, I left out of the screen door, I left the back door open, the windows open, I even blew the roof off. I let everybody in, you know? I just said, come on in, we're entertaining. 
Come on in, you know. Well, you were knocking at the door. I know you're a bad thought, but I'm going to let you in anyway because, what, we're hospitable. So we've gotten this kind of crazy idea that this is how we act. And we say, don't worry. Even if we've entertained all these thoughts, we're going to go to God. And God's going to take care of it all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, I've been dancing with fear, but God will take care of that. Oh, I've been entertaining and celebrating and inviting in and going to bed with lack. And I've been joyously uh, uh, having meals with that doubt and fear and worry and stress. And oh, yes, we've been having a great time in our house. Uh huh. The temple of the Lord is just full of this. Oh, but I'm going to let God take care of it. You know, I'm going to tell you this. We may create fear and support lack and stress. And then when we want this, we want to get God to do something. Hey, I've been entertaining all this fear all along. Well, God, come on, do something. What are you doing up there? Like, you know, out there in the universe. Are you just, just sitting around? Come on, God, go to work, go to work. Straighten out my life for me. Come on, because I've been dancing with all this stuff and entertaining all this stuff. Now I want you to fix it. Really? We want to say this, that you don't try to get God to do something or do anything. Because God is. And God is ising or god is doing and god never stopped doing so it's not like we say well wait a minute i gotta call on god to start doing something i gotta start wait on god to maybe start dealing with this fear and stress or i've got to get god to come on come on come on god hurry up wake up wake up come on god come on and do some miraculous thing within my heart and life and straighten everything out god is being the god is being this very second and god is being all that god can be at every moment there's no on switch and off switch for God. Love, that which is God, is 24-7. There is no on switch and off switch. God's goodness is ongoing. The miraculous power of God is ongoing. It's always at work. The same miracle power that parted the Red Sea is at work today. And it didn't stop. It's like, oh, it happened then. And then, well, it kind of went down to a lull. The power of God, you know, just kind of quieted down. Now we got to whip it up again. And then, oh, it went down again. And but No, it's consistent. God is, and God is, ising, or being, or doing, whatever word you'd like to apply. God is just being God, 24-7 all along. Well, so then, isn't God going to fix things for me? Wait a minute. Who created the problem in the beginning? Did God create your stress? Did God create your fear? Did God go around and say, you know, Amy, I decided some lack and doubt needs to be your gift today. I've created a whole world of lack and doubt for you. No. Who created it? You did. You entertained the thought. You welcomed the thought. And now you're saying, well, God, you've got to fix it. God says, well, the only one that can fix it is you. Because you have to change your thinking. You have the power of choice. This is the beautiful thing that God gave you the power of choice to exercise it and to work it continually. So when you're asking God, oh, God, I've been dancing with fear. Now take fear away. Wait a minute. You have to say, wait a minute. I slam that screen door shut. I'm the bouncer here. Out, fear, you're gone. Hasta la vista, baby. You're out of here. I don't want to see you anymore. I don't want to see any doubt anymore. Out of here. You're gone. I'm getting rid of here. This fear and the stress and this worry. You don't belong in my house, the temple of the Lord. You don't belong in me. You don't belong in my consciousness. You don't belong. You have no place here whatsoever. Well, wow. When we come to that place, suddenly we're taking responsibility for that which is of our own choosing. And we're realizing that is the secret to repentance. You were thinking this way and going this way. Now you think and go this way. That is a turnabout 100%, 180 degrees, a different change in thinking that you embrace because you said, I was thinking this, but I shut the screen door. Say it with me. Shut the screen door. Uh-huh. That's what we need to shout all of life, all of our lives. Shut the screen door to those thoughts. Watching TV, you hear some of that. Shut the screen door. You know, you hear conversations with other people that's negative and tearing you down. Shut the screen door. You just close it all out and allow that filter to be there. Because the scripture says, awake thou that sleepest, Christ shall give you light. 
Awake thou that sleepest. It didn't say, you know, honey, uh, I'm going to do it all for you. Just go ahead and keep on sleeping. Go ahead, hit the snooze alarm. Just go ahead, sleep through life, sleep through the whole world. You know, don't even pay any attention because, you know, you need your rest. I get it. No, awake. Awake means to take responsibility for the thoughts that you've been entertaining all along. Awake, take responsibility, and the Christ, this wonderful consciousness, will give you light and awareness, understanding to see beyond and to see through every situation and every scenario, everything that's going on in this life, in this world. You know, there's some people say, well, wait a minute, there's a lot of bad. Wait a minute, is it bad or is it good or is it just a thing? Well, I heard it's going to rain on my wedding day. That's a bad thing. But didn't the farmer pray? I want it to rain on that day. So is it a good thing that it rains for the farmer and a bad thing for you on your wedding day? Or is it a good thing that supports the farming industry and the umbrella manufacturers? You know, it's a blessing for some. And who's to say it's good or who's to say it's bad? It's all, how are we naming things? And how do we look at things? You see, what happens is when Christ gives us light, we see beyond the appearance of things in this world. Jesus spoke constantly about this, really encouraging us to understand the wonderful power of understanding not to look at appearances, not to look at anything that you have in front of you as this is what's defining it completely. Because you live in a spiritual world, don't you? Now, the physical world has got all kinds of limitations. But in the spiritual world, there's no limitations, right? In the spiritual realm, all things are possible. In the physical realm, all things are not always possible. Because you, all you see are the limitations. So it is what we begin to have this light of Christ that enables us to see things so differently. We're sort of rising up to a higher perspective where we now can look at the world around us with a godly consciousness and awareness. I see how all these things fit together. And yes, maybe the rain on your wedding day is a blessing because the farmer needed the rain too. And the umbrella manufacturer needs to increase his industry. And I want to bless all things. And all. So was it a bad thing or was it a good thing? It's how you name it and how you choose to name things within your world. Jesus did not look at the appearances of every situation and say, this is it. Based on the appearances, this is it. Can you imagine handed a basket with some loaves and fishes and 5,000 hungry men, not counting women and children, means that there's even more, are sitting in front of you. Mm, you've got what? A loaf? I'm hungry. You've got a fish? You know, could I have that? Get out of my way. Could I have that? Get out of my way. Can I have that? No, no, I'm going to have it first. Jesus, break that bread and I'll have some of that first because there's only so much. Well, that would be the appearances, right? Jesus didn't see the appearance of a basket with limitation. Jesus saw the opportunity to break bread and bless it, knowing that it would inspire that others too uh, might experience the breaking and sharing one with one another. And in the end, the story goes on that everyone ate and there were baskets left over. So if you looked at the limitation from your eyes and saying, wait a minute, this is impossible. And people are going to fight over this little bit of food I have. I can't, I can't even pull it out of the basket and show it to anyone. Because if they did, well, they'd mob me right now. Every of this crowd is getting hungry. It's late in the day. They all want to eat. And I only have this. You see how our Viewpoint can be based on when we look at things from the appearances only. Our daily work then is this to really understand how important it is that we embrace a, a wonderful understanding that when we say hasta la vista to these thoughts, when we change our thoughts, when we put the screen door on, when there's a bouncer at the door of our mind, everything now takes on a new direction for our lives. Years ago, my daughter and I were in the Bahamas. She was six years old, and she was sort of spreading her wings and learning to be an adventurous young woman. And I remember one of the hotels had this gigantic ladder slide. You had to climb up to the top and then swoosh down and curve through and land in the pool, and it looked like so much fun. But as this little girl, she stood at the base of the ladder and looked up there, and, Daddy, I can't do this. It's not possible. It's too difficult. 
there's just no way. And I kept saying, honey, you can't, you can't. And in that moment, I just simply said, honey, it's a piece of cake. Oddly enough, I didn't realize that that would be the slogan for my parenting skills the rest of my life with her saying, honey, every obstacle you have, it's a piece of cake. It's a piece of cake. When you're going through tests in life, when you're going through school problems, when you're going through difficulties in junior high, when you're going through difficulties in college, everything I kept saying, it's a piece of cake because it became a metaphor for that moment when suddenly she changed her mind. It's a piece of cake. Wow. And she climbed the ladder to the top and woo, slid down, splashed in the water and experienced the joy, the bliss of a changing thought of a different thought, of a new thought in the experience. So what's most important here is that we have taken time out to really do some work, some protective work within our minds. Protective work, and I don't mean protective work in the realization that there is something you need to work against, but a realization that there is no power from which to protect yourself. Let me explain this. Do we not preach and teach that there's one power? One power, and that's God, not two. In our world today, yes, a lot of people want to say, oh, there's good and there's evil. There's only one power. And I know many of our students and a lot of people are struggling with this thought because all we've grown up with is good and evil. And so we keep saying, I know there's good and I know there's evil. But there's one power and that's God. God the good. God the all good. The love, the grace, the mercy. That one power is the only power. And when we take from it and give power to something else, it now comes alive. So evil does not exist. Evil has no power of its own unless you give power to it. So when we realize that there's only one power, this is our great, shall we say, work of protection. Not that we're protecting ourselves against something, but a consciousness that says, I can be in bliss. I can be in peace. I am now protected from anything that would bring fear, stress, or worry into my life. Because I realize that there's only one power, and that power is God. And I don't give that power away to anything else with my thoughts. Because I shut the screen door. Because I got a bouncer at the door. I got a doorman there that says, mm, I'm not thinking any other thought than this one thought. And that's, there's one power. God. One power. God at work. And when we do this, we then find strength to overcome the mesmerizing thoughts of the world around us. You know, there's a lot of thought of negativity and fear, worry, stress, and it wants to mesmerize us. Do you know what the word mesmerize means? Capture. Mm -hmm. It pulls you capture, captive. It's capturing your attention, and suddenly you're mesmerized by something. You've lost all focus on anything else in the world because it's captured your consciousness, your thoughts, your attention. Ah, but when we hold on to it, there's one power, one power. With this realization, then we realize that I have nothing else to fear. I have this inner protection that's at work, and I am now building on this, and I'm building this consciousness, this full awareness of bliss within my life. What happens then is that we have this wonderful ability then to sort of nothingize anything that comes into our lives. We sort of say, you know, it's nothing because there's only one power, and the one power is all good. You know, you may talk about this, you may talk about that, you may talk about this problem, this situation. I don't give it power. I realize that there's one power, the all good at work in all times within our lives. And so here it is that we realize in this wonderful power that we acknowledge God in all our ways and all things. We notice then that what happens then, that is an example. Well. Let's just say, for instance, God drives your car. You're well, I get in the car. God is working in me and through me, and God is driving this car. And then if we understand that since there's only one being, only one God, and that God is in me and it's also in you, well, then I get on Interstate 85 and I realize God's driving that car behind me too, right? Well, then what am I worried about? What well, statistics say a certain amount of people are going to get in a car accident every day in Atlanta. Statistics say you better be afraid. You better be worried. You got to be nervous. I wouldn't track the highways if I were you. Take the back roads, even if it takes an hour or longer for you. Don't drive on the freeway because you know statistics. You see all those thoughts would come into our lives. But then we realize, wait a minute. God's in me. And God's helping me drive this car. God's in them. 
helping them drive the car. I'm in the good hands. I'm in the wonderful place. I'm in the divine protection in this kind of consciousness and understanding within our lives. So how important it is then that we build this every single day. How about we build and say with consciousness that I am grateful for everything that I've ever received and that God is the source of all these things. And so I need not worry or fear no matter what I have. I am grateful and I experience with great gratitude. God is the source. So I'm not worried about it living in lack or stress or fear or doubt about any particular situation. Here's what we're doing. With this kind of thought process, we're building slowly, step by step, building a consciousness that's truly centered on bliss. And it becomes a consciousness that now says, the way I think every single day of my life, every moment of my life, it now goes on automatic. That's right. You don't have to think and stop. Wait a minute. Is the screen door shut or not? Honey, if you have the screen door shut, lock it. You know, just put the lock and turn it and you know it's going to be there forever. So then your mind now, now moves on an automatic stage of saying, all things are working together for good. No matter what's happening, no matter what's unfolding, I filter those thoughts and I walk and live and breathe in this consciousness of complete bliss in my life. I build on it. I no longer have to consciously think these things. I don't have to force my, I don't have to work at them. I don't have to say affirmations because you know what? I just know that every day I wake up and I say, it's a good day. And every moment I walk onto the road, I said, and I'm blessed. And every movement, every step I take, I say, you know what? I'm walking in abundant life and I'm living it to the fullest. And my consciousness is all happy, joy, ecstasy, bliss. That's where our thought life is meant to be. Paul the Apostle offers us this great truth. You live, and you can live to the fullest, but it's not you, the human, the mortal mind, but it's the mind of God, the Christ mind, the mind of all good, the mind of all joy, the consciousness of bliss. Yet not I, but that consciousness, that Christ liveth in me. This is what we're building today. Amen.